Hello, art history students. Today we're going to continue talking about the art of the Americas. We're going to talk today specifically about Mesoamerican art. Okay, so Mesoamerica is modern day Mexico and Central America. There are four major uh, cultures that we're going to talk about today and the art that we're going to talk about the Olmecs, Teotihuacan, the Mayan and the Aztecs. And there will be two additional videos for you guys to watch on Aztec mythology. And they give you a much better understanding. You can kind of see things in context a little bit better with those videos. So all of these cultures are going to use images as a form of writing. All right, so this is how they record their own history. The Mayans had hieroglyphs and then the Aztecs used pictographs. We're going to talk more about that uh, when we get to those cultures. But first, we're going to start with the Olmecs. The Olmec is, or the Olmecs are the first Mesoamerican culture. They predate all of the others, and they're known as the mother culture. So just to give you guys um, a little bit of understanding, here we have the Olmecs here, and they're just before the Chavin, right? So we talked about them last time. They're also before the Chin, which we talked about much earlier in the class with Bronze Age China. They sort of coincide with a lot of Egypt, and then they also are pretty much coinciding with the Babylonians and Assyrians, whose artwork we also talked about. So just to give you guys a little bit of perspective of what sort of time frame in history we're talking about. The Olmecs are most famously known for these colossal head um, sculptures. So these were found relatively not too long ago in the 1940s, um, and they're believed to be Olmec rulers. So they are made of a hard volca volcanic stone called basalt. And there have been at least 17 of these colossal heads found. So the belief is that they were rulers. And because many of these giant head sculptures were not on display in the, and then forgotten over time and buried, it appears that they were ritualistically buried, or ritualistically buried, which means that they had... Um, they were part of their belief structure. So this is La Venta. This is the archeological site where most of these heads have been recovered. So there have been 17 recovered so far, and they would be found in these sort of burial mounds like you see here in this image. Also, the Olmec civilization created stelas right? Just like we've, this is not the first Stella that we've seen in this class. So when I showed you guys that little graph kind of comparing and contrasting the time frame of the Olmecs, remember that they also coincided with most of ancient Egypt. So we see a couple of the same things. We see a little bit of the use of twisted perspective in this, right? So these shoulders and feet are sort of square with each other, whereas the eye is placed on the side of the head, right? That's twisted perspective. We might see a little bit of hierarchical scale. These two figures in the that are standing on the ground seem to be bigger than all these figures which are sort of floating up in the air. So even though these cultures are very far from each other, there's still that use of twisted perspective, and that is for you as the viewer. So if imagery is your language, is sort of the written language of these people or how they communicate ideas, the most important thing is that the viewer can see and understand the image quicker, which is one of the reasons why we see so much use of twisted perspective in this culture and in other cultures from similar time frames. So this is the Olmec baby figure. This is made of ceramic, and it has a lot of the same features as those large colossal heads, but it's how it was created is very much different. So let's look at some side by side. So this is colossal head number 10, right? And it's made of that um, 
basalt stone and then this is a that ceramic baby figure so both of them have these helmets on this is one of the um, indicators of the Olmec culture is all of their artwork usually has some kind of headdress or some other kind of helmet on right and we can even see that with this kind of pudgy baby here which is a very tender portrait of this baby's face whereas in comparison this ruler this large colossal head has a much more stern face but both of them are pretty accurate depictions of the face right we don't see animal human hybrids at least in this culture with the artwork that they um, left behind but the one reason why I wanted to compare and contrast these two is the way in which they're made so the basalt stone um, colossal head is a reductive process so you start with a larger piece of stone and you're actually carving away the excess right whereas this ceramic piece is made by adding more and more clay to build it up so the fact that they look so similar but have so much different production methods is just something I want you guys to think about. Okay, so that was the Olmec culture, right? So we'll remember them as sort of the mother culture to all the other cultures that we're going to talk about. Next, we're going to talk about a place called Tula, which was the religious center of the Toltec Empire. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. So here we see the Tula warrior columns that would have held up the roof of a temple. So this would have been the largest, in the largest city, um, Tula, which was the religious city of this short, the Toltec Empire was like a short, um, short but influential empire that sort of rose and fell here in Mesoamerica and these are made of basalt so that made of that same hard volcanic stone and we see them in their full warrior garb right so they're wearing their warrior um, suits they're sort of holding weapons I know it's kind of hard to see because they're very closely um, all the imagery is tightly packed against the body but they're they're standing at attention ready and this is a religious center so i think that this really puts into perspective especially if we were to compare and contrast these columns with say the greek columns which were also used as part of their religious symbols right with their little capitals and whatnot these are a much more bold statement about the power of um, these tula warriors and that is important because these figures show what was important to the people who lived in that time. So the people, the Tula people, and all of the cultures that we're going to talk about in Mesoamerica live in a time of constant warfare. There is constant battling between each of these cultures. Cultures are rising and falling and getting taken over by others and whatnot. And it's part of it is because there's just this constant, constant warfare. And we're going to get more into that in just a moment. Okay, next we're going to talk about uh, Teotihuacan which is a term that encompasses both a culture, a city, and a people, right? So this is located in the um, central highlands of Mexico near modern-day Mexico City. This culture would have peaked around 500 CE. So just to put that in a little bit of perspective for you, Rome split around roughly 300 CE. So just about 200 years after Rome sort of started to go into its decline, these folks were sort of rising into their peak. They were massive builders and constructors, constructing over 600 pyramids. And it's important to note that they actually lived in apartment-style compounds. The city was so populated, densely populated, that people lived in multiple family units, um, just like big cities are today. So um, they are looking to the culture that came before, right? Obviously to the Olmec culture, if we look. So what we're looking at here is an aerial view of the 
ceremonial religious center at Teotihuacan. So what we see here is a view of this is the pyramid of the moon. And then here we can see the pyramid of the sun right here. And then way back here in the distance, I just want you to note kind of this area. There's something back in here, and we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But this long procession line, this long um, area here is called the Avenue of the Dead. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So the Avenue of the Dead is runs north to south it's approximately three miles long and like i said it sort of ends at this pyramid of the moon and then on the other end of it is the like a like another sort of religious temple complex area so let's go there now okay it's called the temple of the feathered serpent right so this is sort of a view that's looking over top this is that Avenue of the Dead. There'll probably be a test question about what that road's called. So you might, you might want to remember that. So we're going to look at this Temple of the Feathered Serpent. These are the two major uh, religious figures to the Teotihuacan. This is Quetzalcoatl, and... Um, he is sometimes known as the um, feathered serpent, and that's what I will probably refer to him as just because I'm terrible at uh, pronunciation. So they're depicted all over this temple complex. All right. So this um, god of the, the feathered serpent temple, I put a couple other images here with this just to give you some perspective of how large that head actually is. So if we look here, you can see it's actually very large. When you look at the other image, it looks like it could be kind of small. So I put this in for context. So this is a um, enclosed compound. It's so important that it sort of has walls around it, preceding it, and it's at the other end of that avenue of the dead. So definitely in a position of importance. So this god symbolizes warfare and fertility, the cycles of the wet, dry season also. So that's Quetzalcoatl or the feathered serpent. That's how I'm going to refer to him. Okay. The next place is the Pyramid of the Sun. So you can kind of see here, judging from this image how long and wide this pyramid is it's not a straight peaked pyramid it's a very very wide base to it and um, there would have been a religious center sort of just below it and around this um pyramid of the sun all right so it's the largest structure on the site which does make sense um, the sun is the largest celestial body that we see in our daily lives when we look at the cosmos. So these folks, the Teotihuacans, would have been an early worshippers of the cosmic celestial bodies. We're going to talk a lot more about that when we get into the Mayans and the Aztecs. All right. So speaking of the Aztecs, Teotihuacan was a culture that eventually would fall, and then a later culture, about 800 years after they fell, the Aztecs rose and really admired the architecture that was left behind here at Teotihuacan. So this became a pilgrimage site for this later culture. So you're, you're familiar with that term pilgrimage site from that we've seen here in class before. So it's important to note that as we move forward, especially when we start to talk about the Aztecs. Next, we're going to talk about the Mayan. So the Maya are probably the longest spanning culture in Mesoamerica. Um, they had many, many city states. And again, just to put things into perspective, they also kind of peaked or began their peak they had a very long peak um, right around the time that 
Rome would have sort of started to go into decline here around 300 CE. Um, that's about when, when Rome sort of split and started to fall. So um, the Mayan are there religion is based on mythology, which is some, a term that we've heard before, and also ritual, which we've heard before, but a term that we have not heard before in this class, at least, is cosmology. So this is the idea that the cosmic bodies, so the sun, the moon, the stars, all of those sort of events have a direct impact on you and your life and your culture. And also, most importantly, you have power over them. So we're going to we're going to see how the Mayans had this belief. They believed that their actions directly impacted the cosmos. And if they did not do certain things, certain cosmic activities like the sun rising every day would not happen. They believed so strongly in the connection between themselves and these greater celestial forces, we'll call them. But basically, the planets in rotation, the stars, the, the stars are how people at this time all over the world are charting the change of the seasons. So Mesoamerica has a, um, a wet, dry season. They have like a monsoon season and then sort of a dry agricultural season. So those things are very important to note. And the passage of the stars is what indicates to people, or agricultural people, that they need to start planting their crops. And they need to start harvesting their crops. All those kinds of things are connected to the cosmos. You know, that way of life is connected to the cosmos. And they very, very strongly believed in their connection to these celestial bodies and the mythology that went along with it. So the Mayans, similar to the ancient Egyptians, had their own hieroglyphic system, which is sort of a mix between pictographs and phonetics. So you can see that here. If we look here are some of their writing going down and then here's some of their writing going um, on a horizontal format. So this is Stella. We, we've seen many, many Stellas in this class before. So this one has a supernatural scene on it. And the Stella would have been located near a temple like this one. So this is in the Great Plaza in Guatemala. You can see there are, oops, you can see there are Stellas here positioned all around in this area. And this is the actual temple up here. This is just a pyramid structure that holds it. So this long sort of staircase coming down and whatnot, this is not a building structure that you can go inside of. It is just to hold that little temple at the top. Okay, so I, get, I put up this aerial view of the same um, temple here that you see, just to give you kind of an idea of this temple complex. So this is a religious center or centered around religion. Um, again, these pyramids more are like for platforms for the temples to rest on. The temple's just that little tiny thing at the top. It's kind of an a frame building that will become important here in in just a minute so it takes a sophisticated engineering ability to have this stack of stones like this um, one other thing that's important to know is they have already found hundreds of these pyramids in the rainforest but in recent years due to something called um LIDAR and satellite scanning, all those kind of new technologies that we have, they think now that this culture was actually significantly larger than we originally anticipated. So just, just to note that's kind of things are changing, archaeology is kind of changing 
based on new information about the Mayans. But that won't impact what we're learning about them. They basically just think that this culture was much wider spread, much larger, much more populated than they initially thought. Okay, this is the Bonapak mural. So I said that that little tiny temple at the top would have had kind of an A-frame structure. And on the inside of that would be this fresco. And it's the, like, this wall here is sort of those side walls that come up. So this would have been in kind of a little, um, like an A-frame cabin would have is how this image would have been depicted. So we see a couple things that are a little bit reminiscent of some things that we talked about before. So here in this sort of panel area, we have this very chaotic scene. And this is a wartime scene. And then as we progress this way through the mural, things get a little bit more organized and a little bit more regimented. That's similar to how the ancient Egyptians broke down their images. So we're going to talk about this last panel here. So this whole mural is to commemorate um, a victory. We said before that this class, or that I said before that this culture lived in a time of constant warfare. So when that warfare took place, there was um, a ritual gathering of captives and the Maya would then bring all of those captives that they captured in warfare back to these temples and use them for ritualistic sacrifice. So remember that I said that um, these people had this very strong belief that their actions influenced the greater celestial bodies, the movement of the sun and the moon and whatnot. So they believed that blood on these stairs, right? We won't use red here because that'll be kind of gruesome. So when they would triumphantly go and c gather captives in like a warring party, they would bring them back and then kind of spill their blood in ritualistic sacrifice down these stairs. And they believed that the celestial bodies, which were also their gods, could see that and then the sun would rise again each day. They truly believed that if they did not do this, that there would be a breakdown of the celestial system. And thus there would not be a cycle of day and night, of rainy and dry season, of all those kind of things that as an agricultural society you're dependent upon. So their, like I said, their belief was so very strong in this. It seems so brutal by today's standards and it truthfully it was, I'm sure it was brutal even by their standards but their belief was so strong in this that they needed to do that. One other thing to note is these two places are not the same place, but this it would have been the same structure. So this little temple area would be built in A-frame just like the little temple structure that this bomb pack mural um, fresco would have been in. Okay. So now we're going to dive a little bit more into the importance of religion to the Mayan culture. So this is a Mayan lentil showing a shield jaguar and Lady, I think this is pronounced Jacques. Um, Lady Jacques is a queen and the, this is part of a series of lentils which shows her story. So before we go forward, I just want to point out all of this text that you see here. Remember, remember the Mayans are using kind of a merging of pictographic text and also ideographic and phonetic text. So this is Lady um, Jacques here, and this is the shield jaguar. And we're gonna break this image down. Okay, so the shield jaguar's headdress includes like a smaller shrunken head, might be difficult to see right there, and he carries this burning torch. And then 
Lady Jacques, who is a queen at the time, the storyline goes, as I understand it, is that her husband has passed away and she needs to communicate with the gods to figure out what the next step is, who is to be the ruler in his, uh, his replacement or in his stead. So she kneels before her husband and what she's doing is actually pulling a thorned rope, now it's kind of hard to see, through her tongue. And this is a bloodletting ritual. So the massive loss of blood that you would have from doing something so um, painful and gruesome would lead to a hallucinogenic state. And that hallucinogenic state is how the belief was that they would communicate with the gods, which were both celestial beings like celestial entities like the sun and the moon are gods to the mayans but they're also sort of these individuals that you can commune with and they have sort of human-ish figures so sort of this it's it's sort of like not quite zoomorphic but almost like people planetary morphic that's not a word but you can think of you can see it in those realms so this area um, gives you guys a little bit of context of where these lentils oops, would have been. So this is structure 23 and the um, that's where these lentils would have been found. And this image that you see here is structure 33. I could not find a decent image of structure 23, but you can see these sort of hollow squares that's where this series of lentils would have existed. And they would have been carved over a long period of time, but they're telling the story of this Lady Jacques and um, what she's sort of going through and seeing on her quest to figure out who the next ruler should be. So this is the next lentil in that series. And we see Lady Jacques here again. So this is after her bloodletting ritual. And I know it's difficult to see, but she has a little bowl in her hand here, which would have held um, some of the blood from the bloodletting ritual. And then also I'm assuming some herbs or some other things that she would have burned. And then from that burning, uh, liquid or burning stuff in there there would have the serpent would have appeared and then out of the mouth of that serpent a man would have appeared and this would be the actual god and he would be the one to advise her of what to do in this situation so all of that is being decreed in this text here so it's important to note that this image is both it's pictorial in the sense that you can look at it and sort of know what's happening and digest the imagery that you're seeing and also informative in the fact that there's text there. This is also doing a couple things that we've seen before. Remember the Stella of Hammurabi? How, if you remember back to that, it had the God and then Hammurabi and then that code of rules. And the idea was that that code of rules was being handed down from a higher deity to an important ruler and then on to the people. So this is a very similar thing. It's saying that the de decree that Lady Jacques, or Jacques is going to be in control in her husband's, since the loss of her husband, that is coming from the gods. That's what's being communicated by this series of images, that we can't challenge her authority because it's being handed down from the gods. So that's another part of what is being depicted here. Last but not least, this is the last Mayan artwork that we're going to talk about. And I absolutely love this cylindrical vessel with ritual ball game scene on it. It's such a long, boring name for something so amazing. So in the area of Central America, specifically Guatemala, where the Mayans are centered is where rubber trees come from. So 
they are the inventors of basketball basically it was a very different game at that time than it is today but there would have been this rubber ball that would have been part of a ceremonial game and that rubber ball would have represented a celestial body like the sun or like the moon and there would be this um sort of ritual that would happen where it was put through a hoop All right so this cylindrical vessel depicts that um or a scene from that ball game and you can see that the the character here is wearing this very elaborate headdress and also some body armor this would have this game would not have just been sort of a game in the same way that we see it this also would have been sort of a gladiatorial contest there probably would have been uh, blood spilled at this ceremonial game but one thing that i love about it is the fact that it is a cup that if you went to a game today if you went to a basketball game is very likely that you would get a souvenir cup so this is not the same as that um, this is very much a kind of a religious depiction and has a very important um, the different value level is placed on it but it, when you really think about it since you know circa 700 AD all the way up till today uh, this game has been played with these commemorative uh, cups and objects going along with it so I just find that very wonderful I don't really know anything about um, basketball and I cannot say what the text is here but I just love the sort of parallel between today then and now All right, next we're going to talk about the last culture that we're looking at today, which is the Aztecs. So this is a powerful Mesoamerican empire. They are the ones that were dominant in the region when the Spanish first arrived. Um, they built pyramid structures. And if you remember, they would go to Teotihuacan as a pilgrimage site that was their religion and their belief structure is kind of based off of or in congruence with the structures and buildings that they would have seen there. Okay, so since the Europeans are coming at this time frame, we see a little bit of the beginnings of mergings of culture. So this is a codex that was created by um, the Aztecs, sort of talking about their religion, a little bit about their language and their or their written sort of pictographic language. Their language was not phonetic at all. Their written language was only pictographic. So we have seen this word codex before. It is basically a handmade book. And this this is folio 70R, right, from that um, codex so basically that's image or uh, page 70 R so one thing that you see here that I think is important is just like the Mayans the Aztecs had that belief that their actions impacted celestial bodies and then also those celestial bodies would impact them and they believed that ritual sacrifice was part of that 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 was required for the sun to rise every day so one reason that we know that this was created by a uh, Aztec rather than by say a European observer who would have been seeing this is this sort of heart that's come out and floating in space so if it was done by a European observer they would not understand what's happening to that heart they would be seeing this and seeing it for all its brutality which it is I'm not saying that it's um, not I just think that 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 symbolic lifting of that heart up into the sky and up into the air is part of understanding that belief structure okay 
So again, this is the ritual sacrifice at the top of that pyramid. The Aztecs were notorious for their brutalization of their victims. Um, when they did this, they believed that it had to be a, like a live person being sacrificed and it had to, there's sort of this actions that had to happen during that moment of sacrifice. This would have been a brutally difficult thing to see, certainly to be a part of. And they believed so strongly in this that they, if they could not go out and capture, uh, people in warfare, if they could not go out and capture other cultures and take people from other groups, they would sacrifice their own community members. That is how strongly they believed their connection to the cosmos was, that the cosmos needed these sacrifices and this ritual to take place in order for them to, for the sun to rise every day. Okay, last but not least, we're talking about Aztec iconography and mythology. So there are two artworks that you're going to watch additional videos on. One of them is the Mother Goddess. Uh, her sort of other name is Snaky Skirt or Skirt Made of Snakes. I'm not going to try to butcher her uh, native name. Not uh, good at that. So there's a video, it should be linked below here, talking about this sculpture in much more detail. There will also be a video about the goddess of the moon. So you'll be learning about the mother goddess and then the goddess of the moon and where these sculptures are located, uh, what they mean, maybe what these characters have in common, what they don't have in common, how their stories are connected. Those are all potential test questions that could uh, come from those videos. So make sure that you watch them. They're not very long. They're shorter than this video. Okay, so again, these are both Aztec um, sculptures, stone sculptures, um, that you're going to learn more about. So again, videos will be um, below. Here are your key terms. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much.